Good morning. <clears throat> it's, a joy to, it's a joy to welcome you to the house of the Lord as we gather together to worship his holy name and to receive the ministry of his word. What a blessing. What a gift. Today is the 10th Sunday after Pentecost, and the youth have an event today meeting at Florian Park for the afternoon. There are details about that in the bulletin. So youth and families of youth, bring friends, bring outdoor games, bring card games, bring um, sides to share, uh, suppers provided. Um, this, w this is an event that's been shared with the entire district youth, um, but the idea came from our youth, so please note that. Next Sunday evening is the Parish Ed Expo at Abundant Life Lutheran Church over by Challenger, and two things about that. One is that it's an event that's that everyone is welcome at, but especially those who are involved with Sunday School, um, the Parish Ed Expo. And the other thing about it is that um, Marion Christofferson from our Ambassador Publications and Christian Ed Department is going to be there presenting. And then the, the, the morning, so next Sunday morning, she's going to share with our congregation briefly during announcements on behalf of uh, the parish ed department of the AFLC, and she'll, she'll give a better plug than I know how to give for our new study on the fundamental principles, which, which, is, av excuse me, which is available in the narthex. Um, very soon now, we have our parish day coming up. This is next Sunday? Yes, next Sunday. Is parish day. So if you come to church at 9.30 next Sunday, you will be an hour early, which is not a problem, but just know that church next Sunday starts at 10.30. So uh, uh, Reiner will be joining, um, and we will have church here at Our Saviors for the parish picnic with a meal afterward. Uh, the meat and buns are provided, but if you would uh, consider signing up on the sheet in the narthex for bringing various other things, salads or chips, uh, pickles. There's a sign-up sheet there um, so that all the bases are covered. Wednesday night Bible study is continuing um, here at the church on, on Wednesday at 6.30. Um, the uh, men's monthly study is starting on the second Saturday in September, so please note that and see in the newsletter some more information. At this time, we open our service in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our call to worship is from Psalm 138. Psalm 138 is a psalm of David. I will praise you with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing praises to you. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. In the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. Yes, they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you that you have sent your Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation and to always be near to us, never to leave or forsake us. You are on high, yet you regard the lowly. And so we come humbly before you, knowing that we are unworthy to be in your presence because of our sin but you have sent your Son, our Savior, and it is in his name that we come praying to you. It is in his name that we boldly come before the throne of grace and give you the praise that is due your name. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
We'll turn now in our hymnals to number 578 and sing Amazing Grace. <laughs> Because of God's amazing grace on account of Jesus Christ and because he regards the lowly that our service continues with the confession of sin let us pray together the prayer found in the bulletin confessing our sins to God imploring his forgiveness through Jesus Christ Almighty God our maker and Redeemer we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you, for Christ's sake, grant us forgiveness of all our sins and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given His only Son to die for us and for His sake forgives all your sins. To them who believe on His name, He gives the power to become children of God and bestows upon them His Holy Spirit. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Amen. At this time, I invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word as we hear the Old Testament lesson from Genesis chapter 18, verses 20 through 32. In Genesis chapter 18, God has seen the wickedness of Sodom and is about to judge the city and Abram um, is, Abraham is um, praying to the Lord and finding out, he is finding out just how merciful God is. Genesis chapter 18, beginning with the 20th verse. And the Lord said, 
because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were fifty righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the fifty righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Then Abraham answered and said, Indeed now, I who am but dust and ashes have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than the fifty righteous. Would you destroy all the city for lack of five? So he said, If I find forty-five there, I will not destroy it. And he spoke to him yet again and said, Suppose there should be forty found there. So he said, I will not do it for the sake of forty. Then he said, Let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose thirty should be found there. So he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Indeed, now I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty should be found there. So he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of twenty. Then he said, Let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak but once more. Suppose ten should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of ten. Here ends the Old Testament lesson displaying God's abundant mercy. The Holy Gospel lesson is from Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13, in which Jesus teaches about prayer. Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend, and go to him at midnight, and say to him, Friend, Lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil... Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Here ends the gospel lesson. We confess now our Christian faith together with the entire church, wherever she may be found, using the words of the Apostles' Creed printed in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated as we now hear special music and receive the offering. At this time, we'll turn in our hymnals to number 557 in preparation for the sermon and sing, What Can Wash Away My Sin? Number 557.
Good morning again. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Megan and Rachel, for special music today. Remember, there are copies of the newsletter and the sermon manuscript in the narthex if you'd like. I invite you to stand as you're able in honor of the reading of God's Word. The epistle lesson for this 10th Sunday after Pentecost is again from Colossians, this time chapter 2. Colossians 2, verses 6 through 15, the Apostle Paul continues writing to this congregation in Jesus' name. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumph triumphing over them in it. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, this is your word, and your word is truth. Sanctify us now in your truth, we pray. Do your sanctifying work of convicting our hearts of sin where that's needed and comforting our hearts with the forgiveness of sins through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. At 20 years old, I recited my parents' house in Crookston. The first few pieces were close to the ground. I mean, my feet were on the earth. I had a firm foundation. I could walk in every direction. I was not afraid of the ground falling out beneath me. I was certain that I was safe. But by the end of the day, I was high above the ground. I didn't have proper scaffolding to reach the top of their full two-story house wall. But I did have three ladders and a plank. I, I leaned an extension ladder against the house. And I walked a ways down, and I, I leaned another extension ladder against the house. And then I hung a plank from one ladder to the other ladder using ladder jacks. It's, it's not as safe as like standing on the ground, but you can work safely with, you know, the proper training. <laughs> I'm not giving any building or construction recommendations in this sermon. But I didn't just have two ladders and a plank. Remember, I had three ladders. Because standing on that plank between the two ladders didn't get my arms high enough to reach the top of the wall. And so I took the third unused ladder, and I climbed up the first ladder with it. And being as my high school mascot was pirates, I walked out on the plank. <laughs> and I set the ladder on the plank between the ladders and leaned it against the house and climbed up. And as long as I was focused on the job at hand, as long as I was distracted by the work I was doing, I felt confident. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Oh, I shudder to think about it now. I would just rent equipment to do it safely today. There were times when I was up on that ladder, uh, young and invincible, that I had to reach up both my hands, up high and off to the side, to reach nails that I was having to pound in. And then I became keenly aware I, I wasn't on the ground anymore. <laughs> oh, what, what could possibly go wrong? I had reached the point in this ladder setup that I was beyond a firm foundation. 
I could no longer move about freely. I was now depending on a system that could fall out from beneath me. And there are reasons that OSHA won't allow a setup like that on a job site, and it's because it was unsafe. What a firm foundation gives you is the opposite of those things. It gives you freedom to move around. It, it gives you no fear that the bottom is going to collapse out beneath you. And it gives you assurance that you're safe. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 15, the Apostle Paul tells us about the firm foundation we have in the faith. First, Paul exhorts us to walk in Christ on the foundation of faith. Remember, a firm foundation gives you the freedom to move. How then shall we move? Paul writes in verse 6, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. In, in whatever manner they first received Jesus, Paul is saying, walk in that same manner. So then the question is, how did the Colossians receive Jesus? Paul told us in chapter 1, verse 5, that they heard the word of the truth of the gospel. That's how they received Christ Jesus. They heard the word of the truth of the gospel. That is to say, the manner in which they first received Jesus was by faith. Faith in the gospel word of Christ's death and resurrection for the forgiveness of their sins. This is the gospel. Hear it for yourself, that your sins are forgiven because Jesus died for you and he rose in your place to give you life in his name. Receive this gospel with faith in the crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ and you are saved. Paul's point is that you began with faith in Jesus as the primary thing. So keep the main thing the main thing. Your feet are set by God on the firm foundation of faith in Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. And what do you have when you're on a firm foundation? You have freedom to move. So walk in Christ on this foundation of faith. Paul exhorts us to walk in Christ. He uses that verb, walk, and then he modifies the verb walk with four explanations, four descriptions of how to walk. In Colossians 2, verse 7, he says, rooted and built up in him, then established in the faith, then as you were taught, and finally, abounding in it with thanksgiving. What does it mean to walk in Christ while you're rooted in him and being built up in him? It means to be continually nourished by God's word and strengthened in Christ. We recently saw a baptism take place, and in a couple weeks, we'll see one more. Bring your children to the Lord in baptism. In baptism, God grants the gifts of faith and the Holy Spirit, thereby rooting the child in him, in Christ. How then will the child be built up in Christ? Well, as we hear during the exhortation after baptism, by, giving, by being given a Christian example to follow, first in the home, but also being brought to church. Being brought to church even before they're old enough to understand what's going on. Being brought to worship services and Sunday school and confirmation. And what about after confirmation? continuing to be built up in Christ through their own study of God's Word and through continued participation in regular Sunday worship services and in Sunday school and for the rest of their lives, growing in God's grace and God's truth in the fellowship of believers, learning to participate as adults in the congregation. As you began, so continue. Keep faith as the main thing. You were rooted in Christ Jesus at baptism. God is gracious to build you up in the faith as you daily repent, as you daily believe the gospel. You have a firm foundation. Jesus is the firm foundation. Return to this firm foundation and grow in it. Walk in it. Don't be misled by the distractions and the busyness of life. Don't uproot. Don't unroot yourself from the firm foundation of faith and then be like someone, you know, 
if you can imagine someone dangling off of an unsturdy ladder set up, <laughs> apart from Christ. Instead, walk in Christ on the firm foundation of faith. Paul's second exhortation is to guard the foundation of faith. In Colossians 2, verse 8, he uses the word beware. <laughs> beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. When Christ is the foundation of our faith, we stand firm. We cannot be moved. Jesus is the solid rock that won't collapse beneath us. He will not leave us disappointed. We're told to guard the foundation of faith because the godless philosophies out there that try to explain our existence and try to explain the purpose of our lives without Jesus, those philosophies are empty deceits. They threaten to draw us in by their attractive arguments, maybe, or perhaps by the freedom they offer to indulge without repentance. But it's a trap. Beware, Paul says. Beware, lest you be taken captive and cheated by what? Paul uses the term, the traditions of men, and I think he's referring to this one singular tradition of men that characterizes all philosophies and all worldly, or excuse me, all world religions other than true Christianity, and that tradition is works righteousness. It's man's old tradition to seek righteousness before God by being good enough, by your own works to stand righteous before God. This is works righteousness. But if you're honest enough with yourself to think maybe you're not up to God's standard, then works righteousness would take this form, comparing yourself to the guy next to you who is obviously worse than you are. This is works righteousness, which it is a trap without a foundation. If you began your walk with Christ in faith, but then you became deceived by works righteousness, what you've done is you've left the firm foundation of Christ, and you're teetering on an unstable ladder, wondering if the foundation of your own works is going to hold up or collapse beneath you. Paul says, beware. There is one firm foundation, and it is Christ Jesus. Do you struggle with this? Or is works righteousness a, a foreign struggle to you? Is Paul's word of caution for other people? Or is works righteousness something that all of our sinful natures struggle with? Let me ask you a question. How is your relationship with the Lord today? How is your relationship with the Lord today? Take a moment and think about it. And then also think about what is entering your mind as you try to put together an answer. How is your relationship with the Lord today? If your mind went to things that you have been doing or things that you haven't been doing, then you struggle with works righteousness. This is the tendency of all of our sinful natures. Your relationship with the Lord is only good if it's entirely based on the firm foundation of faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you, not what you're doing. You began in faith. Walk in that faith and guard that faith, not standing on your own works at all, but trusting only and fully in Jesus. Yes, of course, fruits of faith will follow, and, and we should be living godly lives and loving our neighbors and cherishing God's Word. There are things Christians ought to do. We are given exhortations in the Bible. Love God. Love your neighbor. Daily repent of your sin. Daily believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But what makes you pleasing in God's sight is only faith. Faith alone. How is your relationship with God today? Consider answering that it is by faith in Christ alone. And by God's grace, he's pleased with me, his dear child, though by my own works I don't deserve it. 
what a gift to be in relationship with my heavenly Father by His grace. First, walk in Christ on the foundation of faith, keeping the main thing the main thing. Second, guard the foundation of faith so that we don't slip into the trap of works righteousness. And third, be assured on the foundation of faith. There are these things in the Bible called promises. The Bible is full of promises in the Old Testament pointing forward to Jesus Christ who came. And then in the New Testament, reminding us, promising us that what Jesus did is for us and promising his return. There are promises in the Bible. And one of God's promises is that you can know for sure that you are saved and going to heaven. Do you know 1 John 5, verse 13? It says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. You may know that you have eternal life. How can you have assurance of salvation? You're not going to find it in works righteousness. You're not ever going to have assurance if you're examining your Christian life to see if you're doing enough. Assurance comes through faith alone not by looking at your life, but by looking to Jesus. Paul directs our eyes three times in verses 9 through 15 in Colossians chapter 2 to Jesus. He directs our eyes to Jesus by using the phrase, in him, meaning in Jesus, three times to give us assurance that we're saved. First, in verse 9, Paul directs us to consider who this Jesus guy is in whom we are trusting. Paul writes, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus is God, and only God has the power to forgive sins. Only God has the power to save. And guess what? Jesus is God the Son, and he did that for you. He did that for you. Second, in verse 10, Paul directs us to consider how God sees us when we are in Jesus. He writes, you are complete in him. Last week, I saw this quote, and I wrote it down, but I apologize, I didn't write down who said it. But it does illustrate well how God looks at you when you believe, and, and how he sees you as, as complete, as, as perfect, not lacking anything in Jesus Christ. Quote, Stop imagining that God is pleased with a future version of yourself. God is entirely pleased with you right now. Not because of your qualities, but because of Christ in you. You are complete in him. Let, let me repeat the quote. Stop imagining that God is pleased with some future version of yourself. God is entirely pleased with you right now, not because of your qualities, but because of Christ in you. You are complete in him. End quote. Be assured. Be assured on the foundation of faith because Jesus who saved you is God. Be assured on the foundation of faith because God regards you as complete in Jesus. And finally, be assured on the foundation of faith because, as Paul is about to explain, God has so thoroughly connected you with Jesus Christ that in Christ, you are buried with him and raised to life with him. It's in Paul's third in him statement that he tells us exactly what spiritual work God has accomplished for us in baptism. Now, some Christian denominations don't see baptism as something that God uses and God works through to save us. Instead, they see it as some kind of outward demonstration that we make of our commitment to God. But listen to Paul's language, the words of Scripture themselves. Is God at work in baptism? Colossians 2, verses 11 through 12. In him, in Christ, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God 
who raised him from the dead. What's happening in baptism? In baptism, the working of God is happening. In baptism, you were buried and raised with Jesus Christ through faith. Now, what does this have to do with our assurance of salvation? Remember how works righteousness doesn't give us any assurance because it focuses on our works. Baptism is the opposite of works righteousness. It's God working to wash away our sins. It's God working to grant us faith, to grant us the Holy Spirit, to grant us righteousness of Christ in His sight so that we are complete in Him. I'm not saying that anyone who ever has been baptized is forever saved. It is possible to uproot, to unroot yourself from Christ and, and walk away from the faith and unbelief. That's why Paul gives the warning, beware. But to the person who has long ago been baptized and has since walked away, I say, come back. Repent once again. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Return to the, return to the faith that God gave you in your baptism. Repent and believe the gospel. And to you who do believe and who are walking with Christ, take comfort. Take comfort that this is what God did for you. He died for your sins on the cross. And he ordained by his grace to deliver that forgiveness to you through his means of grace, primarily through his word as we hear it. But he also has designed his word to be attached to, to some physical things. And one of those physical things is the water of baptism. And this passage is regarding that promise. It is for our assurance. You can doubt your own works. You can doubt your own sincerity. But when you look to Jesus and you know that you are a baptized child of God in his name, you're standing on Christ, not on yourself. You're standing then on the firm foundation of faith. God will grow fruit of faith in you to love him more and more. He'll grow in you love for your neighbors. God will grow deeper sincerity and devotion in you. But beware. Beware of slipping into works righteousness. Always turn to Christ, trusting in him resting on the firm foundation of faith. So as you walk in Christ, as you guard the foundation of faith, and as you are assured of your salvation by what God has done for you in Christ Jesus, may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We'll turn in our hymnals now to number 143. Christ is made the sure foundation, number 143.
please bow with me in our closing prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your great love for us and your mercy and your kindness, giving us a firm foundation on which to rest, Christ Jesus, your Son. We pray, Lord, that you would draw us daily in repentance and faith, building us up in the faith which you granted us in baptism, which you sustain daily by your mercy through the continued nourishment of your word and the fellowship of believers in your congregation. We do pray for those in our congregation and beyond who are in need of your care and your help. We pray for Oris and Debbie, for Rachel Dahl, for Duke and Larry and Betty and Patty, for Chuck and Wanda and Sarah, for Dana and Bev and Ruby and Jordan and Casey. We pray for Linda Hornseth and her daughter Mary, for Neil and Lola and Irene and Jan and Rose and Carol and Gordon and Julie. We pray for all of our servicemen and women, asking that you would provide their daily bread, even as they do work for our nation to provide our daily bread. We pray, Lord God, that you would be at work through the missionaries in the Association of Free Lutheran Congregations and those who share your word around the world, including even us. We pray, Lord, that you'd be near to and comfort and encourage and strengthen the emergency service workers, the healthcare workers, those who are at work in mental health in our communities. We pray for each of our employers and coworkers. We ask, Lord God, that you would have mercy and that you would draw all men to faith in Jesus Christ. It is your will that all would come to the knowledge of truth and be saved. So we pray, Lord, let your will be done in our lives and all of theirs. We close praying the prayer that Jesus taught us even in today's gospel lesson. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please stand and receive the Lord's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.